All right, good uh, evening in Belgium, but maybe morning, afternoon, or night somewhere else in the world. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, Humans Are Hard and Code is Easy with Tom Henriksen. As always, we start by thanking our uh, sponsor from the very beginning, Cuazo Services. If you ever are in need of uh, some kind of software solution with a decent amount of analysis to make sure it solves the right problem, and this is definitely a good company to talk to. Um, details about Tom are available on the slide, but maybe Tom, to start and get you to know you a little bit more personally, what's the weather like in, in Pennsylvania at the moment? Well, in Pennsylvania, the weather is really nice. It's uh, 50 degrees, which I should Google what that is in um, Celsius, but uh, it's, we're having fall weather here and it's, so that's 10 degrees Celsius, like Google's quick. Um, but yeah, it's really lovely weather here. The, the leaves are turning. I was telling, uh, talking before about the colors are great here. It's uh, here, in, I live in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. So it's it's kind of interesting. A lot of people from, like I was talking before, New York Pencil and Philadelphia will come up here to look at the trees and stuff. It's a it's kind of a rolling landscape or right along the Delaware River. Um, if you're familiar with, you know, uh, U.S. history. There's a town called Washington Crossing, which is just like a, a couple miles away. And that's where Washington crossed the Delaware. So, if you're, um, but yeah, it's very pretty here, and uh, you know, hoping to have a great conversation with everyone today. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to give the floor immediately to you. Um, I will show the open-ended Mentimeter, so I think people should be able to share their questions, and it should allow you to do your opening uh, break. Uh, okay. I Excellent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate the introduction and I'm excited to be with you guys. Um, so to, to kind of get things started, hopefully this will work. Well, I guess we'll see how it works. You know, we never know. Um, but I was uh, I have a, a short little icebreaker I'm going to share with you guys. So feel free to if you can jump onto Mentimeter and that way, I guess um, we can use that as essentially as our chat for some open-ended questions and things. But to kind of get us started off, I like to share a couple icebreaker questions with you. So, and feel free, like I mentioned, if you can log on to Mentimeter, use the code, um, jump in there and share with us, and we'll go through this short little icebreaker first. So if you could have a superpower, what would it be? So jump on over to Mentimeter, use the code, and then share what superpower you would use. So I'm gonna jump in there myself and see if I can get in, make sure everything's working okay. So jump on over there, share what superpower. So time traveling, <laughs> superpower equals flying, yes. Super speed, like the flash, flying would be great. Yeah, make people experience things from another person's perspective. Well, that's a good one. That's a good one. Flying. Lots of people want to go fast or fly. It looks like they want to go somewhere or do something or, you know, travel really quickly. Predict the future. That would be nice, right? As a business analyst, that would be nice if you could predict the future and, and, and it, especially with, as you create requirements, um, that would be, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? Very good. Very good. Thinking between the lines. Yeah. Look into the future. Lots of good things here. Very good. So the second question I want to ask you guys to uh, answer is, as as you might have gathered, I'm a developer. So my background is a software developer. And I understand as business analysts, sometimes there's you know friction between developers and business analysts. So with that, I want to ask you guys, where have you struggled with developers? So maybe what are some of the things you've struggled with developers? You know, maybe... Um, I'm guessing there's a few things, but I'd like to hear what you guys have to say to that. So where have you struggled with developers? I just had to reset the Mentimeter, but I think it should be working if people refresh. Yeah, that. yeah, it looks like somebody already put something in there to code. Yeah, sometimes they they go to the code, sometimes they think in code, sometimes they go to the code too quickly, right? They don't read the requirements or understand things, right? Understanding requirements, yep. I'm guilty of that quality of the code, yeah. The old bugs, those come up a lot, don't they? 
modeling models. Yeah. Level of detail in requirements too much versus too, you know, it's funny. I was talking, I was actually talking to a group of project managers just last week and this same level of detail came up. Uh, that's one that it does come up often and it can be a struggle. You know, some developers want just such specificity, others, you know, don't need it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle, isn't it? It's hard to convince developers that you are also able to understand what they do and also understand the customer at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that, that customer empathy is something I think is so important, especially for developers, but also too, I'm sure as you guys as business analysts under, you understand the importance of that as well, that the business, we need to understand the business stakeholders, infinite nested loops, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been guilty of creating a few of those myself. Too much code, arranging objects. Yeah, the, the the developers can get into the code and then try to kind of get carried away, you know, right? Just a little, little too much sometimes. So yeah, that's that's a tough one. Very good. Yeah. So so one last question I have in this icebreaker, I want to ask you guys: what makes people successful as a business analyst? So feel free to share, pop it in there. What makes someone successful as a business analyst? You know, it could be one word. Uh, maybe it's a couple things. <laughs> Say it works when, when I run it. Yeah, it works on my machine. So what, in your mind, makes someone successful as a business analyst? <clears throat> Ooh, communication. Networking, adaptability. Yeah, those are good ones. Listening, detailed, delivering value. Very good. Good analyst and communication skills. Deep thinker. Yeah, very good. Very good. Guessing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It always helps to have a, some guessing skills, doesn't it? Very good. Very good. Being a great liaison. Yeah kind of being able to talk business and then talk maybe geek or code on the other side where you're talking to the developers or, or maybe the project plan when you're talking to the project manager, asking the right questions. So, okay, it looks like chat is now working. Very good, very good, excellent. So, good facilitator of communication between the user and the developer, yeah. Facilitation, that's an important one have to be able to do that. So, and we see also in the chat there too, problem solver. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Well, I'm glad we, we, looks like we've got the chat working. So very good. And I appreciate all you guys sharing these answers to the icebreaker questions. It's been good to kind of get to know you guys. So just to kind of give you guys a little overview of what we're, we got here, it's uh, about 15 minutes after the hour. And I want to make sure we honor our time box. So what I'm going to do, I have I have a presentation. So I'm going to do first half of my presentation. Then I have some questions for you guys. And then I'll go in and we'll do the last half of my presentation. Then we'll wrap it up with some more questions just so we make sure we go through and, and get to our time box. And then to the point, I know somebody brought this up before. So anytime, if you guys have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to share in the chat. Maybe there's something I say brings up a question you want to feel free to put that in the chat as we go. So that way you kind of have that there and we'll come back to that, like I said, when we have a little stopping point. So with that, I'm going to share the first half of humans are hard, code is easy. Now I want to remind you guys, so as I mentioned before, I'm a developer. So this is kind of from my background. So you're gonna wanna think about this as I say things, for instance, like our title name is humans are hard, code is easy. So I always like to remind, especially like talking today with you guys or business analysts, think about that from, the business analyst perspective. Maybe you would say something a little different. Maybe you would say, you know, humans are hard, requirements are easy or something like that. But think about it from your perspective. And then as we, we get to those questions, we'll be able to, to think about that because we're going to cover some things. We're not going to, we're not going to talk about code per se, but we're going to talk about some of these important, um, some people call them power skills or soft skills uh, today. So with that first half of humans are hard, code is easy. Here's a string of thoughts that ran across my mind early in my programming career. Why can't people just leave me alone and I can do my work? I can figure this out myself. 
I don't need others' help or any input to turn this thing around. Why don't people understand me? I think it must be they're just dumb. They don't recognize genius when they see it. Perhaps you've been there too, a frustrated developer who feels like they know enough. However, the success you thought you'd have is out of reach. You see others who make better strides, but why? Is it a skills gap? I want to share with you how I learned about my skills gap. Java, check. Linux, check. SQL, check. Humans, what? Humans are hard. Code is easy. So I focused on the technology. One of my first mentors was a database administrator named Doyle. He really knew his stuff, but didn't say much. That can make learning challenging. One thing Doyle would do is fix the problem for me. Doyle would fix it so quickly and then leave. What did you do? He was already gone. Working with Doyle gave me some insight. Technical people hate explaining basic stuff. Ask them a simple question and they will flip the bozo bit on you. What is the bozo bit you say? A few years after working with Doyle, I got to work with a software architect named Corey. He had many interesting observations. If you asked him one stupid question, you know, the kind of basic question you could have answered by doing research on your own, he wouldn't answer your questions or work with you. That, my friends, is the bozo bit. Bozo, of course, refers to Bozo the Clown, the bit in reference to computer bit or binary storage. Corey was pretty extreme, but many developers can be that way. To gain respect from those developers, we need to know the technology. Humans are hard, code is easy. So I focused on the coding. I learned new technologies. I tried to keep my head down and avoid getting the Bozo bit flipped on me. A few years later, I transitioned to a new role, technical lead. One year during my annual evaluation, my leader said to me, Tom, we think you have solid credentials. Coding skills got you the job, but we need you to develop other skills. My leader shared with me where I was failing, delegation. He shared how I wasn't delegating work to my teammates. Case in point, there was an upgrade that needed to be done. <laughs> I did the work in 10 minutes or so. To explain that to a few teammates probably would have taken twice that amount of time or more. Another trap I fell into with delegation is the belief in our values. We can convince ourselves that we're worth more when others can't do the same work as us. I remember working with Jamie the first time. I wasn't quite sure he understood what we were doing. He was always done quickly. Then I finally asked him. Here he had created a script to deploy changes and update dependencies. Oh man, I was doing this all manually. I was worried about delegation and the people I worked with had better ideas. Perhaps I didn't know everything I thought I did. A few years later, I got to work with a leader named John. We knew each other through a mutual friend. I had begun to coach individuals and teams. John wanted an outside resource to help him change his team's mindset. He shared how most IT people work with others in a transactional fashion. We get the requirements and we solve the issue. John said, Tom, my team is like bank tellers. They get asked to fix something and they do, just like a teller gets a check and deposits the check. I want my team to be more like financial planners. A financial planner builds relationships, then they can anticipate needs. So you're saying, John, you want your team to have better relationships with their customers? John said, Tom, if they have better relationships, they will develop empathy and understanding. Relationships, understanding and empathy? Huh, that won't work. That's what I thought at the time, but I was wrong. John knew his team was as understanding and as empathetic as he'd hoped they'd be. He began requiring them to talk to the community directors when they traveled. These conversations helped them empathize. Instead of just fixing the problem, they fostered relationships too. Each little change John made helped his team understand the community directors had many things on their plate. These conversations also worked the other way too. 
the community directors began to give John's team space. If something went wrong, they trusted them to resolve it. John proved me wrong. He overcame his deficit by being curious and empathetic. He was able to change the way his team interacted with the organization. And he became more influential in the organization, so much so that he has since been given additional responsibilities. From bank tellers to financial planners, he remade the image of his IT team. This brings me to my main idea. Coding skills got you the job. Influence will get you the career. Coding skills got you the job. Influence will get you the career. What do I mean? Developers are focusing on technology skills only. If we truly want to set ourselves apart, we need to know how to influence and collaborate with teams. Gone are the days when we can just send in the requirements with pizza and out pops code. Organizations are looking for more from their developers. The problem, my problem, was I was terrible at relationships. I had confirmation, I had proof. Although I didn't start out as a developer though, my first stop in my professional career was quite different. My first job out of college, it seems like yesterday. I started at Wallace. What is Wallace? Well, we sold business forms and office supplies in Des Moines, Iowa, kind of like Dunder Mifflin. Armed with a business management degree and no real idea, I had three job options when I graduated from college. I could sell insurance, or I could sell life insurance, or I could sell business forms. So I did what any sane person would do. I sold business forms. Who wants to call on our friend's parents for insurance anyways? Did I mention that Des Moines is the insurance capital of the world? <laughs> Back to my first day at Wallace. Can you believe I had to make a few cold calls before lunch? Let me remind you, in college, the only time I called my friends was when we were having a kegger. Getting people to buy business forms is a bit more difficult than getting college students to drink beer. Now, I really didn't want to make those calls, but lunch was getting close. <clears throat> I was given three prospects from another sales representative to call on. Hello, uh, this is Tom Hendrickson. Is uh, Mike Huff available? Uh, sure. Can you let him know that Tom Hendrickson called? Yeah, yeah, I'm from, I'm from Wallace. Click. Hmm. Uh, hello, this is Tom Hendrickson, your new Wallace representative. Oh, sorry, Mr. Hegna. I apologize if our labels fall off your product. Click. Whoa. Guess we got disconnected there. Okay, just one more and we can go to lunch. What? Do we call on gentlemen's clubs? My coworkers all die laughing. Turns out this is their way of initiating new sales representatives. My sales gear whew, went down in flames pretty quickly. Similar to Tommy Boy's sales techniques, mine weren't appreciated. Soon after my first day in sales, I started to realize something. This wasn't going anywhere. A friend from high school shared with me the opportunity in technology. So I began to pursue a new path and get a new degree. I left my job in sales and began work as a developer. Now, working as a developer is quite a bit different than working in sales. The sales office I worked in was always full of people talking. They would be talking on the phones to customers or talking to each other. The developers I worked with, well, they were a quiet bunch on the whole. Friday afternoon in the sales office, the newest rep had to go get beer for everyone. Friday afternoon for the developers was quiet just like the rest of the week. Now, perhaps it's starting to sound like I didn't want to make this change, but that was not the case. I slowly began to realize I was more Spock than Jimmy Fallon. The quiet, contemplative work of a developer suited me more. As my technology career began, I worked with lots of tools and technologies, but I wanted to move into something more current. I started to hear a lot of buzz around the Java language. In my free time and nights and weekends, I would read and work through tutorials. All this work paid off a few months later when a company leader came to me and said, Tom, would you be able to help Dave with a new application? 
turned out they needed someone who could write an application using Java. I, of course, agreed. Like Luke, beginning to use the force, I was starting with some basics. As my Java skills began to improve from experience, I, I learned a few other things too. I began to work with someone who was quite sharp from the technical perspective. But Eric wasn't easy to get along with. He would yell at people he worked with. You might say he was a complete jerk sometimes. The managers and team allowed this to happen in a large part because he was productive. I can still see it now when I close my eyes. Now, Eric was a smoker and he was trying to quit. This made Eric even testier. Eric and Sri were working together on some files when I came walking down a row of cubes and Eric was in Sri's cube yelling. You know how people get mad and their veins look like they're gonna pop out of their head? Eric's veins were about ready to explode. Then he ran out the door. I guess he needed a smoke. I asked Sri if he was okay. He said he was okay, but then looked at me and said, no one should have to put up with him. Sri couldn't have been more correct. Eric was a tyrant who ran around like Darth Vader, intimidating people. We all put up with this terrible treatment just because he was able to code a lot. Even though developers act like Spock, we have feelings too. I would like to tell you that Eric was let go and the team was able to move on. The company did nothing to him. His behavior was left on handle. If you work with a coding hero like Eric and they take all the tough work, it can make it easier for the team, but it can stunt the overall growth of the group. If you work with a coding hero and they take vacation, whew, things can fall apart. Ben was a leader that I worked with, and he had a coding hero. We'll call him Dave. Dave would code solutions that were more complex than others could understand. Dave was coming up on a milestone birthday. To celebrate, he was going to bike across multiple states with all his gear. Now, Ben knew this was going to be an issue. So he met with the team, and they discussed the challenges. The team decided to begin to have knowledge transfer sessions with Dave. Ben helped foster this collaboration, and this enabled the team to slowly chip away at the knowledge gap, and the team became more resilient. At my next stop, I began to master my skills in Java. I was responsible for an application that required me to learn some new technologies. Software development can be a bit like trending song sales on iTunes. One day something's hot, phew, the next day it's out of date. During this time in my career, many open source tools became popular. Mastery for Luke Skywalker came after a battle with Darth Vader. Programming is a lot like writing. As the author Stephen Pressfield says, the amateur tweets, the pro works. Professional programmers show up every day and slay small demons. Now, the first skill I had to master as a developer was debugging. Of course, today the tools are much more mature. One of the first applications I had to debug didn't have any such tools. <laughs> I was armed with print statements and a log file, quite primitive by today's standards. All right, let's see here. Where is that value being set? All right, let's add a print statement. Recompile. Oh, compile error. I forgot the semicolon. Okay. Add that semicolon, recompile, run the report. No, 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 no. The database isn't set up right. Okay, let me update that table, run the report, uh, tail the log. Hmm. Now that looks better. Of course, debugging is so much easier today, but we still need to use the old bean. As Steve McConnell points out in his book, Code Complete, we need to learn the types of mistakes we make. Early in my Java career, I made the same mistake time and again. I would forget to initialize my variables. I can still hear my coworker Ken laughing at me when he would look at my code and point out my obvious error. We need to take a step back and reflect on how we are doing. How can I improve my coding, debugging, and testing? Software developers like to impress each other. I had to use the singleton pattern to fix that. Don't worry, most developers don't know what that means either. 
There are many esoteric topics we can talk about for hours. In Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, Greg McEwen shares how important editing is to journalism. Now, the journalists bring the stories and write up the ideas, but the editor has an important job. They review the piece and rework it. Over my years, I've mentored many developers. One in particular sticks out. He began reading about code basics. This made him add unnecessary code from time to time. I remember debugging an error he was getting together when I asked him, hey, uh, why is this loop here? He looked at me unsure and said, uh, I don't know. I thought it would help. Whew, he thought it would help. Once we removed his unnecessary loop, we resolved his error. Adding code is easy. Knowing what to keep is hard. Now, it's not that I'm saying computer science basics are not important. We need to master these too. However, if we put our sole focus on them though, our careers will falter. I spoke before about Eric. He had mastered computer science. His teammates couldn't stand him though. We need to be good at our work and get along with our team. If we do just one of these, we aren't doing our job. All right, that is the first half of Humans Are Hard, Code is Easy. Pause and see if anyone has any questions. Feel free to share any questions in the chat. Most of the panel, there we go. All right. Now I just put a, hopefully, you, well, I guess hopefully you guys can see my question uh, that I put in the, the chat. Uh, yeah, feel free to share your chat or your question there in the chat. So I put in the chat, I guess, uh, if you, if somebody has a question there, you can share it. What happened to the log file? <laughs> yes, the log file. Well, the log files are still around, uh, but they're, uh, they've been replaced by many uh, other tools. I guess I'll say it that way. There's lots of, lots of tools in that, that we've replaced log files with, but they're still around. You can still find them. It's just, you try not to, to jump into log files if you can avoid it. It's one of those things. It's kind of like, um, you know, searching as the expression goes for a needle in a haystack. But yeah, there's still there's still log files out there. It's just there's better tools to find things. You probably heard of things like Splunk and things like that. So, but yeah, the the log files are still there. So, um, but I put a question in the chat. How have you guys fostered professional relationships? So feel free to share in there uh, in the chat how you guys have fostered professional relationships. So you heard in the first part of the um, presentation there, I talked about learning from John. So John was a VP of technology at a firm that I worked with. And he shared with me how important, um, you know, those professional relationships are as, you know, as, I'm sure as business analysts, you guys understand this for developers. Maybe we, we take a little time to learn this, but uh, those relationships are so important. So I see we have being on site and having quick informal chats. Yeah, that's a good way to, to build those relationships, trying to be honest and asking the devs to communicate. Yeah. Yeah, get them involved, ask them questions. It's a team lead for a while and having one, yeah, one-on-one -on -one meetings is the best way. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. That's an important thing you bring up there, Paul. The one-on-one -on -one meetings are important, especially just to kind of, now I know I'm generalizing here, so apologize, but a lot of times developers are introverts. So, you know, I know that's a shock to a lot of you, um, but yeah, I think sometimes they operate better, as you mentioned there, Paul, in that kind of one-on-one -on -one setting. And that's a good way, like you said, to kind of um, get to know them a little better and, and to make, make things uh, a little more, uh, you know, build that relationship. Uh, yeah. Friday afternoon after work beers is always a good one. Yeah. Developers like that, everybody like, you know, business analyst, I'm sure everybody enjoys a, you know, a kind of a relaxed setting where everybody can have, you know, a drink of choice, whatever that may be. Uh, yeah, but definitely need to foster relationships. Okay, so how did I, I do foster the relationships I have? So for instance, what, a couple of things I've done um, is try to keep in touch. This is something I think a lot of people overlook. So as you, maybe you move on to a different company or something um, or start a new role, um, but always to kind of keep in touch with people you've worked before. Um, I think that's a good way to kind of build professional relationships. Obviously, you know, you, 
as you many of you here are part of the IIBA, that's a great way to build a relationship with people in your role, for instance, like as business analysts or, or whatever your role might be. Um, that's a good way to kind of foster other relationships, but that's, that's always a good way. That's a couple, couple of the things I've done here, but I'm sure other people have, have things as well. Give the opportunity to explain things and ask, rephrase it. It's too technical. Yeah, that's, I think, uh, and there you bring up a good point that sometimes developers can get really technical and that's that we need to rephrase things. And, and I think that's important just to keep asking questions and, and try to, um, you know, get it to the point where, you know, uh, and, and this is something I heard somebody say this once. They said, you know, if somebody really understands, for instance, like a developer or even like a business analyst, for instance, like if a business analyst really understands things, they should be able to rephrase it in plain English and not use jargon. I mean, we can all use jargon, whether whatever role we're in, or maybe we work in a certain, for instance, like I work for a health insurance company now, um, and there's a lot of jargon in health insurance. I'm sure you guys, depending on whatever domain you're in, you know, there's, there's jargon that we throw around and we're like, oh yeah, the blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you know, if you're new, you're like, what does that mean? So yeah, there's um, lots of different ways to kind of see working in an agile culture makes things different, how we interact. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing. So working in an agile teams is something that sometimes developers will struggle with because they want you know, usually in an agile relationship, there's there's more interaction than than you know than maybe they had before. So that can be a struggle. Um, I think I'm trying to remember if I've talked. But this is later in the presentation. But there's a person you'll hear about later in the presentation that really was uh, really struggled with interactions and uh, very introverted developer. Um, but yeah, that's that's something you know if you can try to find ways to to get people to interact. So yeah, lots of things. And, and I think somebody brought up there too, like language barriers can be something too, especially as you're working with teams internationally. Um, but that's something I think it just, you know, it takes time. Uh, for instance, I know I've worked with people from lots of different parts of the world. Um, and it usually, you know, after a, a little while, you kind of get their, um, you know, how they, how they talk, how they communicate. Even, um, I think I mentioned it earlier, but like my family moved from the Midwest, kind of the center part of the United States to the East Coast, people here in the United States different parts of the United States speak differently. We're speaking the same language. And, and even like you think about, you know, there's people across the pond, as they say in England, they have different terms as well. So yeah, we, our, our language, you know, depending on where, you know, if you, you know, are, are is a hurdle, but it's something you can easily overcome, you know, just working on it, but step up from team member, I think her manager was struggling. Okay. Yeah. So I think you, you uh, made a step from a kind of a individual contributor to a leader that can be a tough, um, a tough transition. Um, there's lots of things that, you know, that can, can be somewhat problematic, but it depends, I guess, I know I heard somebody. So for instance, you'll hear a little bit later, I, I became a leader in an organization, but I was, it was a new organization to me. I know I've heard people say, for instance, like if you work in a, on a team and then you get elevated to a manager role, that can be a struggle too, because those relationships where you were peers, um, that can be tough because you might, for instance, like you, you might've been someone's peer and then now you're their boss or manager or whatever the term may be, team lead, um, you know, those that can be a struggle as well. So very good. All right. I have another question for you guys. I want to share here. I'll put it in the chat. Hopefully you guys can all see this. So um, as you heard in the presentation, I have did not start as a developer. So I was actually in sales. You heard that. So my question to you guys, have you always worked as a business analyst uh, or what kind of career transitions have you made? I find that as I ask this question, a lot of times people will have uh, interesting uh, career transitions. And then two, there's there's kind of things that we learn along the way. I know, for instance, I've learned a lot of things that I call transferable skills. Other people will call them that as well, that, you know, as we move along the the kind of continuum of our career, there's certain things that we we take with us and we, we you know, will learn and, and are applicable in a lot of different roles. So feel free to share in the chat, for instance, like maybe you've um, transitioned and uh, from something I, I know I've the other day I talked to a uh, uh, business analyst, was a teacher and then became a business analyst. Um, so there's lots of different, you know, ways people come to this. Anne says, I graduated as an interpreter, changed career path to a test engineer, test manager, and then the business analyst, okay? Cash management and logistics. 
I apologize if I don't know if you guys can pick that up. I think there's some people doing some work on our neighbor's yard. So traffic engineer. Interesting. Lots of different things here. Technical writer, hybrid technical writer, business analyst. Very good. Support engineer, QA engineer. Developer, functional analyst, financial advisor. Interesting business analyst. So yeah, so those are some interesting. It looks like a lot of people have some very varied career paths. So those are always good. I find it's interesting. Um, I, I actually worked with someone who was really good BA that was an English major in college um, and, and mentioned how that was helpful. But yeah, science, tech support writer, and product manager. Very good. Very good. Lots of interesting career changes. So. Awesome. All right. And so one last question before we jump into, or actually I want to make sure we stay on our time box here. I'm noticing we're, we're further along than I was thinking here. So accountant transitioning into BA role. Mm. Well, hopefully you can leverage some of that accountant uh, expertise. So, but all right. So I, I'm looking at our time here. I want to make sure we stay on target here. So here he was a started as a sales rep, became a teacher. Interesting. Product specialist and then a consultant and analyst. Very good. Very good. Interesting. Yeah. Always find this fun. That's a that's a question that I really enjoy asking and, and love to hear the, the stories, kind of the career journeys people have been on. So, but as I mentioned, I want to make sure we stay good to our time box and we end things on time. Um, so I'm going to do the second half of Humans Are Hard Coded Easy. And then I have a few other questions that we'll do before we wrap up. So just so you guys uh, know, so feel free. And like I mentioned before, if you hear something in the conversation, maybe it's a book, um, feel free to ask in the chat. If you have questions, I'll, I'll go through those as I come to the, uh, um, we come to the last part of the question and answer. So feel free to do that. So, and again, I apologize. I don't know if you guys can hear that. There's some people doing some work outside, but um, this is the second half of Humans Are Hard, Code is Easy. As I learned more about soft skills, my career progressed, starting out as a developer, then I moved into a senior developer role. Next, I was a technical lead, and then finally I moved into manager of software development. At this point, I was feeling pretty good about my career progression. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Friday morning in May. I came into the office at my normal time, a little before 8 a.m. Oddly enough, my boss was in. He usually came in at nine or after. I sat down and unpacked my things. Then my boss, Scott, came to my desk and said, Tom, can I talk with you? I said, sure. And then I followed Scott to his office. Although when we came to his office, he took a ride instead. Hmm, that's strange as I thought as I followed Scott down the hallway. Then I took a, we took a left into Sandy's office. Who is Sandy, you ask? Well, she was the director of human resources. We sat down and then Scott said, Tom, this is your last day here. If you've ever had that said to you at work or in a relationship, you know what it feels like. The rest was strange as I felt a calm come over me. I knew something was going to happen. Although as I looked across the table, I could tell Scott and Sandy felt terrible. They discussed the next steps. I packed my things and left. Getting fired gives us a good chance to reflect. What did we do wrong? How could this have been avoided? As I look back, I realized one lesson first. What led to this was a lack of clarity. I needed to ask better questions. Therefore, the team I led did not execute accordingly. Processing this took time as first we can get frustrated and want to blame others. However, we need to own our mistakes. That helped me move forward. The second lesson I learned was the importance of relationship management. As John taught us earlier, we need to continually foster our connections. I began to reach out to my network and the opportunities were plentiful. So even in something as trying and frustrating as getting fired can be a moment for learning if we take the time to unpack the wisdom. Mastery, mastering basic skills requires guidance. Early in my career, I worked with a developer named Wei. He instilled in me a systemic approach that I still use today. 
Software development is essentially problem solving. Way began to notice, oftentimes I was trying to solve five different problems at once. Way's guidance was brought clear to me a few years later when I attended a seminar. At Michael Hyatt's best year ever conference, he discussed goal setting. Michael said, detailed plans are great if you're building a nuclear submarine. He continued, for everything else, just focus on the next step. Way and Michael agreed on this point. Don't overthink it. In Proverbs, it is said in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Luke's journey first brought him to Obi-Wan Kenobi, where he learned some basics, similar to what I learned from Way. He kept learning, and so have I. Reflection doesn't come easy for me. I want to move on to the next thing. In David Marquis's book, Leadership is Language, he details the red work, the doing, and the blue work, the thinking. In the book, he discusses how they are both important aspects of making progress. He walks us through the Industrial Revolution where the workers did the red work and the managers did the blue work. Today, us knowledge workers must do both. A simple pause can give us a chance to step back and reflect, how can I or we do this better? Think, apply, reflect. By now you're starting to think, Tom, I'm a developer. I don't need no stinking soft skills. Of course, if you don't want your career to get better, keep on keeping on. My career path has changed dramatically as I've learned the importance of communication, relationships, and influence. Let's explore the three core soft skills. These will set the stage for a career transformation. So remember, coding skills got you the job, influence will get you the career. Number one, at the core of communication is listening. We need to listen to what is being said, make eye contact and observe body language. Developers who do this write better code. They don't assume they know the answer. In the book, The Pragmatic Programmer, Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas talk about the importance of digging for requirements. Look between the lines. Part of communication is knowing your message. Number two, at the core of relationships is understanding their interests. In How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie describes how we need to talk in terms of the other person's interest. I once tried to convince a corporate vice president we should use a new technology. He wasn't interested at all. However, the next time I spoke to him, I landed a technical change with a corporate objective. The outcome of that conversation was quite different. Number three. At the core of influence is finding a connection. Ted is a new tight-lipped project manager. Nobody on the team can get a good read on him. We both joined the Zoom meeting early on a Friday morning when I asked Ted, good morning, Ted, any plans for the weekend? He hesitates and then begins to share, yes, in fact, I do. My partner and I are gonna show our Welsh Springer Spaniel at the dog show this weekend. He hesitates and then shares more. This short interchange helps us begin to connect. Remember the three core soft skills, L, U, C. Listen, understand their interest, connect, L, U, C. These are the building blocks for influence. These three core soft skills can change your career. In my first role as a manager, I tried to get to know the team. This can help build trust and influence with them. Perhaps you're starting to think, these won't work for me. AJ was a strong developer, but he rarely talked. He worked in a slow, methodical fashion and always kept his emotions in check. Over time, his teammates became irritated with his style. I tried to get to know him. For instance, we connected on a few things. AJ traveled to Germany to pick up his new BMW. He was quite excited about that. Still, his unwillingness to communicate with others, and especially the product owner, was wearing thin. That's when my manager came to me and said, Tom, it is time for AJ to decide if he wants to be part of the team. My manager asked me to put AJ on a PIP or performance improvement plan. I had 60 days to help him improve or else. Despite his strong coding skills, his career was on a downward trajectory. When I met with AJ and explained the situation, he yelled at me, I'm the best developer you got, and stormed right out of the meeting. 
The first two weeks after this incident were really shaky. AJ wouldn't talk to me or anyone. I kept checking in with him daily. I knew he was an introvert. He needed his space and time. Eventually, AJ and I sat down and discussed the PIP and how it made him feel. That's when I got AJ to agree to try some experiments. Excuse me. We met as a team and created some working agreements. These clarified everyone's role. Also, it stated how we would work together. I got the product owner to give him one final shot. In the end, we were able to give AJ the space he needed. Along with coaching him and his teammates, we were able to work through it. AJ was able to develop the soft skills he needed to change his career direction. And I was able to communicate and influence the team using the three core soft skills. I learned how to help AJ, myself, and others. You can do this too. Coding is important, but it's not enough. We can keep our head down and bozo it through our career, but that won't get us where we want to go. Relationships matter. Empathy and understanding matter. Communication matters. Practicing these soft skills can give you more influence, which leads to more success. Better collaboration with your coworkers, people seeking out your opinion as an expert, managers choosing you for the most exciting projects. Practicing soft skills is how you code the future of your dreams. All right, that is the end portion of Humans Are Hard, Code is Easy. I'm gonna pause and check here and see if we have any additional questions, okay. I'm gonna put a question here in the chat. So as you heard, as we came back from that break, I had a career misstep, I was let go at a company. So um, I always like to ask people about, you know, their career missteps. Now, obviously, hopefully it's not that um, extreme, but you know, we've, I'm guessing some of us have done things like maybe sent the email to the wrong person, maybe invited the wrong person to a meeting or didn't invite the right person to a meeting. Um, another thing we've probably learned a lot too during the lockdowns is, you know, maybe you said something when you thought you were on mute and you weren't on mute or, you know, or maybe, you know, you turned on your camera and didn't realize what was behind you or, you know, there's lots of different career missteps, but feel free to, you know, share in the chat. Maybe you've um, made a career misstep or, or made a mistake. So feel free to share that. Keep believing in myself was very important. Yes, that's important, man. You have to keep, especially when you get situations where maybe you doubt yourself. Um, but yeah, it's important to kind of believe in yourself and and make sure that you know you're you're taking care of yourself. Kind of that self care that's an important one too, especially in those those uh, challenging we'll call them challenging situations that we might have. I ask why. Yeah. It's always good to ask questions. All right. Once again, I apologize. I think our neighbors are getting some tree work done. How do you ensure um, you're aligned in communication? So as you heard during the presentation, we kind of, a lot of what happened there, especially when I was let go, that was a lot around communication, making sure we weren't aligned in it. So feel free to share. Um, in the uh, chat, what some things you do to help uh, make sure you're aligned on, you know, communication. It says, have you ever felt imposter syndrome? That's a question I see here. And that's a good question. So yeah, I think that's a good one that um, a lot of people have felt that I know I have at times where you feel like, you know, maybe you don't belong in this situation. Um, I know somebody who brought up, you know, something that said, uh, you know, to look at your experience and, and just to give yourself a little grace, but then too, to, as you do things, for instance, like you might not think you're qualified to be maybe a, a senior member of the team or something like that. But, you know, there's people that are always, um, you know, you have to think about the people that believe in you, but then too also kind of think about where you've maybe, for instance, learned new skills before, for instance, like if you're, maybe you're new to being a business analyst. Think about other things you've learned before and, and new skills you've learned. So I think that's a good way to kind of combat that uh, um, imposter syndrome. Reconvene what you, re you recommend. Would you recommend? 
All right. So yeah, aligned on communication, aligned verbal and non. Yeah, that's you bring up aligned and verbal and non nonverbal, I think is what you mean by their communication. Yeah, there's there's a lot of facets, isn't there? You know, just from you know, you see, for instance, like if we just send an email, that's one thing. But if we're talking, you know, there's more to it than you know, if somebody says something, but maybe maybe they're joking with you. And you know, sometimes that's something too you learn with people. Um, their slang or or terms they use when they're kidding and maybe when they're serious. Um, yeah, ask ask if they're feeling okay. Yeah, with the way you communicate towards it. That's a, that's a good question there, Ann, to kind of think about. You know how how people are reacting. Um, sometimes you'll notice people, especially you know, like for instance, if it's virtually, if you have your cameras on, you can kind of see how they react. Um, sometimes you can tell that maybe maybe you've hit something that's troubling, or maybe they're you know, for instance, maybe they're going through something in their personal life that's really troubling. Um, that's a good thing just to kind of ask them to see if, you know, how they're doing, you know, maybe they're struggling with something, maybe they have uh, someone who's ill or something in their family. So yeah, those are, are good, good things to think about. So yeah, it can be hard to make time for communication. Yeah, that's true, Helen, it can be hard to make time. But I think I guess it's one of those things that's, it's hard to make time, but then to the, the other side of that, you know, for instance, like if there's miscommunications or things that also takes up time too. So yeah, it's, it's something that it does take time, but I think it does pay dividends down the line um, when you do take time to, to do that. So, but with that, I know, I think we're kind of to the end of our time box. So I just want to make sure we honor that. Um, I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, making time is one aspect that is important. Yeah. To connect. Yeah. That's a good point. But I just want to thank you guys for this time. I know you shared some valuable time. Some of you um, late in the evening for you. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, with that, I want to thank the uh, IIBA of Brussels. And I'm just going to put my LinkedIn connection here just in the chat. Feel free if there's something additional um, you want to reach out, uh, feel free to connect with me. And I appreciate that. And with that, I'll turn it back over uh, and we can close it on out. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, for your uh, engaging story it's a different way of doing a webinar and i liked it very much and i can definitely make the connection with ba work ba work is also a little bit like coding uh, just with a different type of language and different types of models so there are definitely very clear uh, parallels with uh, the story you bring from your experience and your background so thank you very much for that and thanks to the audience for their active participation um, to end the webinar, or before we end the webinar, we also have an official thank you certificate of appreciation that we like to share with our speakers, because we know very well how much effort it takes to prepare these kinds of things. So once again, thank you very much um, for your efforts and time. We would also love to have some feedback from the attendees. So if you go to this Menti link, you can uh, fill in a very simple form uh, so that we can capture feedback on this webinar and it helps us improve obviously for future webinars so please do um, take uh, just a few seconds of your time to fill in this small form and then finally I'd like to promote our upcoming events uh, we have as always every Friday since the beginning of the first lockdown in Belgium our uh, BA Cafe every Friday at 12.30 in uh, Belgian time, so Central European summer time. We have actually people joining in from across the globe, so some people get up at 3.30 their morning to join our cafe, which is really nice. It shows quite some dedication. It's just an informal chat, so if you haven't experienced it yet, please join us for, even if it's just five minutes, you can find the link on our website. And we have also, together with the BA and Beyond Conference, our autumn event coming up with a workshop and um, an evening session, a free evening session on the high impact BA. So that would also be inspiring to uh, move your career and influence forward. With that, I will uh, close the webinar, um, but I will leave uh, the session open just a few seconds in case people have some final words to share in the chat thank you very much and have a nice evening